Hello, everyone. Welcome to the final session of the 2020 BYLC South Asia Youth Resilience Summit. We are delighted uh, to have you with us. We have a very distinguished uh, speaker with us who's joined us all the way from California. But before I introduce our speaker to you, allow me to invite you uh, to write in the comment section how your experience has been uh, at the BYLC uh, Summit in 2020 over the past three days. What has been your biggest takeaway? And uh, we want to hear from you where you're joining us from. And, uh, and subsequently, please uh, keep on sharing your questions you have for our speaker. I'll be taking a lot of questions today. Uh, as you know, we organized uh, the, the, the South Asia Youth Resilience Summit to create an opportunity for young people to engage with experts from diverse fields, to have a conversation on, on how young people can think about the future, how they can address uh, this current crisis, how, how, how they navigate this crisis. Because young people all over the world are faced with uh, a profound challenges, uh, which is uh, more pronounced in South Asia, particularly because we have more than 100,000 young people joining the labor force every single day. And this is for a, a UNICEF report uh, recent, uh, recently, and uh, beyond the health implications, there will be a lot of economic implications. Uh, this is a depressing time, but we wanted to have some pos positivity, some resilience, and, uh, and, and, and create an opportunity to, uh, to forge the way forward for the young generation. And with that spirit, we organized this summit. Uh, we had a great conversations for the past three days. And our final session today, uh, we have a, a leading figure uh, in, in corporate America, he is uh, none other than uh, Dr. Omar Ishraq, the chairman and CEO of Medtronic, the chairman of Intel. And Medtronic, as you all I'm sure know, is, uh, is the largest medical technology company in the world. And, uh, and, uh, and for me personally, and for many of you watching from Bangladesh, it is also a special opportunity because Dr. Ishraq spent many years in Bangladesh. So he's one of us, we take pride uh, in knowing him. And uh, so without, without further ado, uh, Dr. Ishraq, welcome to the 2020 summit. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you. And thanks for that very kind uh, invitation. I look forward to the dialogue uh, today. Thank you. How, uh, uh, let me begin by just asking, how has uh, being in isolation uh, been for you so far? Well, you know, uh, I'm in California right now. I'm actually, um, uh, we, we live uh, in uh, Minneapolis, but we do have a small home here. Um, so um, it's, it's been okay. We've been working remotely, but that works uh, through WebEx and video conferences and so on. So that's been going on. It's been a little, uh, little change in the way we do business, but, but you know, we've we made it work and have achieved a lot in a very uh, short time frame. Um, you know, my family uh, is here as well. So my uh, daughter who normally lives in New York is here with us uh, and my other sons are here. So, so that's, um, that's, that's good. It's a relief to have everyone together. Uh, and, um, you know, things here are reasonably okay. <laughs> okay. You know, you obviously have to uh, follow all the guidelines and safe distancing and so on, but, um, but look, it could be worse. So I'm, I'm pretty thankful that we're safe and, and, and doing our work. Thank you. Uh, just to give a shout out to our uh, viewers online, we have uh, more than 350 people who have joined us uh, online. Please let us know where you're joining us from. And uh, we'd love to al already, uh, there are a lot of questions coming in. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think, let me just begin straight away with a question because uh, this is an opportunity for young people. I have a lot of questions myself, but uh, we wanted mm -hmm. to create, uh, give as much opportunity to young people who have something to ask uh, to you. Mm -hmm. uh, Anika Farzana is asking, there is a serious shortage of medical equipment in South Asian countries, uh, while mm -hmm. the overall healthcare system is very poor compared to many developed countries. What yeah. strategies can our governments take to overcome these challenges, particularly in the context of COVID-19? Let me just add to that, uh, and I'm sure you know, you're aware of this, in a country like Bangladesh, uh, we have less than 2,000 uh, ventilators for, for a population of 165 million people. Uh, and the case is not much better. India, I think, has less than 50,000. I was reading up some reports, uh, which pales in comparison to the need. How, how will South Asia cope with this uh, serious shortage in your assessment? Well, you know, uh, ventilators is one thing. You need an ICU system as well. You need the trained doctors. So just by getting equipment 
uh, isn't going to solve the whole problem. Uh, and um, uh, now that doesn't mean that we shouldn't try to uh, make as many as possible and provide as many as possible, but that has to go in line with setting up uh, temporary hospitals and so on. So, and I think a lot of that work has been done. Uh, however, um, in a country, in these countries with such large populations, um, I mean, the best thing is try to avoid a situation where you need an overuse of uh, heavy use of ventilators. Uh, so I think the uh, measures that the governments are taking make a lot of sense. Um, you know, imposing uh, strict measures to keep people away from each other and practice all the social distancing uh, uh, methods uh, to uh, force some discipline around wearing protective gear, um, impose the uh, discipline of washing hands or convince people to do that. You know, all those things that we're, we're all now familiar with uh, are actually important. And in my view, in uh, countries in Asia with large populations with relatively underdeveloped healthcare systems, uh, that is the best option. Because, uh, you know, I, I think you'll all agree that if this, uh, if the if the rates of um, the, uh, of the disease and and eventual escalation reach that of uh, countries in Western Europe and so on, it'll be very difficult to manage. No, no matter how many ventilators you have, you need people who need to use them, and you need hospitals, and uh, and in some of these situations, actually, you need pretty high end ventilators. Um, the, the the cheaper ones uh, can only take you so far, but many of these patients are in a state that you need you need a sophisticated ventilator. Um, and, and again, using that is going to need training. So the best approach, I think, is to is what the government is doing now. The problem that creates is an economic problem, and it creates in South Asia and in other uh, underdeveloped regions of the world. It creates a, a, a problem for the poor in terms of food. And so I think um, finding ways to deal with that, which can be, those are solvable problems. That's in our control. Yeah. Good organizations can deal with that. You can figure this out. Uh, the other one is outside our control. I mean, we're doing our best, but you know, none of us can control uh, COVID-19 and the way it's going and figuring out how to manage it. I mean, th that, that is a problem that we have to manage with, uh, with factors that are outside our control. Feeding people, making sure people are organized, maintaining social distance is all up to us. So, you know, take what you can do and do the best you can. And I think uh, to some degree, uh, I'm um, glad to see that the rates haven't dramatically increased in these countries, more than glad relieved so far, but uh, we've got to keep it that way and try to contain this as much as possible. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, lots of questions are pouring in. We have 525 okay. uh, plus viewers with us online. So thank you, everyone. Mm -hmm. um, I will try to get through to as many questions as I can. And, and as I'm looking at the questions, I'm trying to organize them. Uh, let me, sure. a lot of business questions are coming in, a lot of, you know, uh, questions about when do you think this crisis will end. But before I get to the business side, uh, let me uh, sort of expand a bit more on the ventilator side um, sure. and, the, and sort of the medical capacity in South Asian countries. I was mm -hmm. watching your interview recently um, where you said that, you know, uh, Medtronix, you're ramping up your capacity. Uh, by right. June, you're expecting, uh, you know, 1,000 ventilators in your Ireland factories per week. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have also, uh, for the betterment of humanity, uh, open sourced one of yeah. your uh, uh, models. Yeah. And uh, and I I I I saw that uh, seventy thousand um, people have downloaded already that that, uh, yeah. that open yeah. source. Uh, uh, what is the response in South Asia? Have a lot of people taken up the uh, the production in South Asia? Where is that headed? Sure. Um, first, uh, you know, the download number is massive. That grows all the time. It's over 100,000 right now. So people are interested and many people are trying on their own. Um, but um, in the end, the problem here is not, and you know, what we did is we, we uh, open sourced the one that we felt others could do most easily. Because if you have a very complicated one with all kinds of complex software and all that, it's very difficult to do. So we downloaded the one that has enough capability to be useful but simple enough that uh, if others wanted to manufacture those in volume, they could. And we rapidly realized that the uh, issue here is going to become sourcing of components uh, because uh, you know it has certain components. And once you have uh, enough people who can make it, they'll all want components. So you need multiple sources for these components. And there are some components which in fact have single sources. So there, you know, if there's a fight over that component, it's not gonna help anybody. 
whether that component goes to our factory in Galway or goes somewhere else and a ventilator comes out, it still is one ventilator. So you need to expand your sourcing. And so we, uh, what we did is, uh, you know, we had lots of requests, but we selected uh, uh, some organizations who had manufacturing capacity and we felt had parallel and complementary sourcing capabilities. So that big sophisticated supply chains, but not for our industry. So that would give us the option that you diversify, if you like, your sources. So instead of all going to the same people that we all know, these companies build other things. So they have other supply chains. And through that, we felt that we could broaden our sourcing base. And at the same time, uh, these companies could do manufacturing so they should scale manufacturing. And, and that we did across the world. And, and in fact, uh, Asian uh, organizations were first in terms of their preparedness, in terms of wanting to work with us. And uh, we made the most progress with um, Foxconn, which is a Taiwanese based company. Now they will, uh, they, I think most people have heard of them, they're a major company. They make volume components for companies like Apple and so on. And they're gonna help us. Uh, we're very far advanced in manufacturing. They'll manufacture in the US, but they're a Taiwanese company. The other company, other, another three companies I wanna highlight, there's a Vin Group company in Vietnam who've also made a tremendous amount of progress and in fact, redesigned one of those single source components, uh, uh, which gives us a lot of flexibility. Uh, and, uh, and then in addition to that, um, we have Walton in, in Bangladesh who are also uh, demonstrated a lot of uh, creativity uh, and are well prepared to manufacture, uh, but you know, we're, we're working on sourcing for them. And then we have Tata in India who are also uh, very focused on this and created a good structure uh, through which they're doing the same thing. Uh, and so these are the four, and there's also a company in Canada, which is obviously not in Asia, but, but these four partners, we've so far limited to right now to be get to a point where our sourcing scale becomes well diversified, which we think in a few weeks we'll get there. We've been working very hard on this with these companies while maintaining our own production. Um, uh, working with these companies to to help them get you know these these are medical products they go the tube goes inside a patient you've got to have safety you've got to have um, make sure that these products are safe uh, and so the quality systems have to be right so we spend a lot of time uh, creating capability to do those things and work on our sourcing and I think the first products will come out within a few weeks and then eventually with the uh, uh, with the diversified sourcing. We think by about June, July, you'll get this at scale. And then, then we will engage other partners in other regions in emerging markets uh, who have that capability. Uh, and now we have a broad diversified sourcing base. And I think we can, uh, we can move quite quickly at that point. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one from uh, the CEO of Renata. It's a leading pharmaceutical company in Bangladesh. Kaiser Kabir, mm -hmm. he's asking, how effective is the ventilator designed by MIT students in your opinion? That's one question. Let me also add another one uh, by mm -hmm. Mr. Akhtar Motin Chaudhary, uh, who used to run a pharma company before, is, is the chairman of the board of uh, BYLC. Uh, mm -hmm. His question is, what is your company doing to make medical equipments, particularly ventilators, affordable to developing countries? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, let me take those two different questions. You know, for, first of all, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the MIT one, there's been another one from the University of Minnesota. These are not full of ventilators. They, they are like uh, what we call ambu bags, which automatically kind of uh, uh, press a, a bag through which oxygen is delivered. These are not intubated patients with, a, with an airway that goes inside the patient. So uh, the ventilator is a fairly sophisticated product that is needed in the ICU setting uh, for the patient. These other uh, sort of ventilators help sort of keep people alive for a little while, while they're waiting for the ICU to open up. But, uh, you know, the patient's condition isn't really treated that dramatically. They're, they're just gonna put on, put on enough support to stay alive at least for a while. And then often when they are recovering, they need a weaning process and some of these ventilators are used for that. But, but uh, so, so th those, are, those are really very temporary devices uh, that, that have been designed. This is not something, I mean, look, uh, students and all are very uh, innovative and have new ideas, but you know, these are sophisticated devices. You don't build these things in one week from scratch without being experts at it. 
you know, people who design our products have been working on ventilators for 25 years. And, and you know, there's a lot of sophistication in the critical care, really critical care ones. So, so that's my comment there. There's actually an article on that uh, in the Financial Times, which just came out a, a, a day ago, uh, where they talk about that in Europe, in, 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 in the UK. Where they've they've seen this 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 issue kind of arise. So even people like Dyson and so on, the specs weren't clear, and they struggled a little bit. Um, in terms of the um, of the second question, the low cost. You know, th that's a more general question about cost, and I'll, I'll come back to that. That this this actually has given us an opportunity to uh, to make sure that uh, ventilation is never going to be a problem in the future in, in Asia or in, in emerging markets because. Uh, you know, we've tried, and many of you may know that uh, I've personally been very uh, uh, passionate and, and, and been focused on, on providing and creating healthcare in, in, in Asia and uh, in the emerging markets. And, and we've learned that the three factors of, that have to be taken care of to deliver high quality healthcare, I don't mean primary care, I mean hospital based care where you do sophisticated kind of treatment. You need an awareness, you need people to know that this disease can be treated in this way, that a ventilator is needed for this purpose at this time. You need training. You need people who know how to use this, when to use it, who to use it on, how to do it and do it safely, because these are products that you know, are invasive into patients and, and there's lots of risks if you aren't trained properly. And then you need infrastructure. You need ICU capability for a ventilator. You need hospital infrastructure. You need you know, hospital beds. So unless you have these three things, Lowering the cost is not going to do anything. I can make 2,000 ventilators and leave it in a village somewhere in South Asia, and they will be scrap metal because there's no hospital, there's no ICU bed. So these three things have to go together. Once these three things happen and you get scale, the cost will come down. That, that's not an issue. You get that kind of scale, the cost will come down and people will afford it. And, and besides, the value would be so obvious that people will prioritize the spend in, in, in those areas. And let me finish by saying that this uh, sort of unfortunate episode in many ways is an opportunity for ICUs in, um, in emerging markets to come up because now there's a crisis. People want this, people want the ventilator. There's clearly awareness. I don't think anybody in the world today doesn't know what a ventilator is. And so there's awareness amongst the population, amongst governments, around doctors, funders. So we've got to take advantage of that uh, awareness. And that's why we're so focused in working with third parties, in open sourcing our, our, our products, because we need to do this quickly. And we don't want to wait till we do everything because you know five people working on this together can do it more quickly than one. And, and so that's been the way we've been thinking about this. Thank you, I think that's very helpful. Um, so just to summarize what you have said, it's not just the ventilators, it's the support services in ICU. You need the yes. medical professionals, other equipments, it's a holistic, sort of delivery that has to be ensured for patients. Right. While right. I understand, uh, while I understand, uh, uh, you know, Medtronic focuses on the high end, more acute stage ventilators. Do you, uh, do, you, do you foresee that this may force countries in South Asia to come up with more inexpensive, uh, you know, uh, yeah. sort of uh, assortments of, well, no. uh, of, of, of ventilators? And do you also foresee a future where uh, many people will have ventilators at home or, you know, is that something that no, in yeah. the future you think well, uh, may happen? Yeah. Well, listen, let's separate these out. Uh, first of all, the uh, open source design is a lower cost design. Uh, to give you a perspective and uh, uh, the, the, the price, if you like, of our high-end ventilator is like three or four times that of the open source. One. So this is already, uh, this in our view is the lowest end ventilator that can be used for patients in critical care. So instead of thinking about cost, let's think about the acuity of the patient. And, and, and the patients we're talking about are patients who need to go into an ICU, into an intensive care unit. Once you have to go into an ICU, you need to have certain capability around you. And that capability is not something you can just deliver in a home. You, know, you just don't have that trained infrastructure, the monitoring, it's not just a ventilator, you need pulse oximetry, you need a whole bunch of other things. Uh, and you need a caregiver. And so an ICU just cannot be replicated in the home. Now there are um, other ventilators that actually just pump oxygen. And sometimes the invasive ones are used at home. 
but but that is that is a different uh, kind of a product which is more in chronic care. People with obstructive uh, disease or lung disease that require care over a long time can get help from some sort of an oxygen-based ventilator that can help them breathe better. And that they use all the time. That's the kind of thing you can do at home. You cannot make a home into a temporary intensive care unit, uh, no matter what you do. Uh, you need a lot more than just a ventilator to make an ICU. Uh, and so uh, I don't think that's uh, practical. Now, people confuse these things. There are ventilators that are used at home, but these are not the uh, acute ventilators. And, and it depends on what problem you want to solve. If you want to solve a problem with a patient who's in acuity and uh, who's got a serious state, you just cannot do it in the home. And you've got to do it in the hospital. And you've got to make sure that, that's, that the hospital system is affordable enough. And uh, just having a free ventilator even isn't going to solve that problem. So I, I think if you get volume, which we will get through these open source uh, companies who are locally based uh, and who will also modify those products with language and all that stuff so that locally they can be used. I think that is, we felt the best option of at least treating people uh, in hospitals. The home is a different product and, and you know, that can be done as well, but uh, you know, we're not uh, doing that. We could, we do actually have one or two products like that, but there are other companies bigger than us in that area. And, uh, I'd encourage them to, to do the same. Yeah. Um, th there are a lot of questions coming in uh, around business opportunity. So let me transition okay. to the business side. Yeah. Um, yeah. Nusrat Jahan is asking, besides uh, developing medical technologies or equipment, what are the business opportunities in the healthcare industry in South? Oops. Ajaz, you dropped off. I can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, you okay. froze. I, I heard you say, what are the other opportunities in healthcare outside of, uh, you know, hospital? Medical techno right? yeah, medical technologies or equipment. What are, what are the other opportunities in healthcare in South Asia? Well, you know, there's there's plenty of opportunities. There's uh, there, there, there's uh, training for doctors, uh, and bringing up not only doctors but um, um, sort of uh, caregivers in some way. Uh, there's lots of opportunity in, um, in managing chronic disease. You know, in, uh, I, I go to uh, Bangladesh uh, or Dhaka, you know, every so often. And I've noted, and I've seen that in India as well, but, but certainly in Dhaka where I've been a lot more. I've seen little, uh, you know, little uh, sort of uh, areas where uh, people sit down and they do these little blood tests and so on. Blood tests and diabetes tests and all these things, which I thought was very innovative. So, so they charge you, uh, you know, a very small amount of money and, and they target people, I've noticed outside parks and so on. So people are already uh, aware of their health who go for walks in the park and so on, then stop at these things because they're conscious and then they go and uh, check and, and they do such things. Uh, but then, you know, something like that, if you could translate that uh, in a way that uh, you have software that not only you know, does the test but collects the data because these are simple tests, like a little blood glucose test that takes like you know less than a minute, and uh, other other such uh, kind of tests and so on that they sell temperature or whatever else, um, and they charge a very small amount of money. But the data is coming in. If you could take that data and then the, maybe train the medical uh, the, the the guy sort of selling these things uh, to ask a few questions about how someone's feeling, whether they've had any. Uh, uh, previous history. I mean, they're the standard questions you could ask. And you form that into a database and put it out uh, and connected that to uh, more sophisticated caregivers in primary care, or, you know, there are other systems that could be made up. Um, I know, for example, Prava in, in, in Bangladesh, they're, they're kind of building something like that, but they're, they're based in the hospital itself and they're going from there. But, but things like that, where IT and software uh, in a very focused fashion is used because you know cell phones and so on are completely uh, you know available everywhere. People know how to use them. Use that existing infrastructure and create focused products that help them is at least an opportunity. I mean, there I'm sure there are many other opportunities. That's just one thought that uh, you know I've had, and and and, and Medtronic, you know, a group is looking at something like this. But uh, I'd encourage anybody with an innovative mind to, to look at things like this, to, to take care of people who've got chronic conditions. You know, Medtronic makes uh, critical care equipment, but I think in South Asia right now, 
it is uh, it is equally important uh, to uh, keep people away from hospital, to keep them healthy, to manage chronic disease, of uh, and, and educate them regarding their habits. I mean, that's another area that one could go after, because I'm not sure that's well understood uh, as to what to eat, what not to eat, how often to exercise, you know, things like that. So I think um, keeping people in good health is a big opportunity using the existing um, sort of software infrastructure that, that is available around the world and anyone can do. Thank you. Um, let me uh, go to another question. Um, I think your, uh, your sort of perspectives on business opportunities was very helpful. But a lot mm -hmm. of people are asking questions, for example, Minhaz Anwar, when is this crisis going to end in your opinion? And I want to sort of add to that, what, mm -hmm. what you're saying is we need to uh, keep people away from hospitals. If you want to keep mm -hmm. people away from hospitals, then you need to prolong your lockdowns. But in South Asia, where we do not have the, you know, the budgetary capacity in the public sector uh, to sort of keep on giving you know, uh, stimulus packages like in the West, and it's a very uh, difficult sort of trade-off for countries in South Asia, where we have large informal sector. What's your take on uh, how long these, uh, you know, these uh, lockdown periods uh, should continue in South Asia, and how should countries here uh, navigate this? Well, listen, I'm I'm not an expert in this area, and I'm just um, sort of forming opinions as I watch the news and, <laughs> and kind of uh, look at how things are developing. Uh, but in my, my view, um, uh, you know, I think people will agree that the lockdown is having a positive impact all over the world. I mean, wherever that has happened, the rates have actually stabilized and, and, uh, and, and it, it's taking a while. And I do think that at least, um, you know, one reason why um, the, the spread hasn't uh, dramatically escalated in, in South Asia is probably because of the measures that, that have been taken. Uh, and uh, I think the, the authorities are right in, in being conservative about that and pushing that out as, as long as possible till you can at least see a flattening of the death rate and so on. And, and then even then, I think um, some of these habits will have to continue into work. Now, it is much more difficult in, in, uh, in crowded uh, situations with a lot of population, a very high density of population to keep social distancing uh, uh, you know, for a very long period of time. But whatever it is, uh, it can be better than what it was before. So things like washing hands, you know, I mean, there's many things we cannot do, but there's a lot of things we can do. Uh, you know, to the degree that you can um, you know, wash hands regularly, keep your distance from people when you can, uh, avoid big gatherings. I think these things will have to continue uh, as long as possible even after the strict lockdown is released so that that can only help so so learning how to do that is um, and teaching others how to do that and everyone taking the responsibility of doing it right themselves and be an example to others all these things can only help so people should do that uh, and I, I that, that's from a disease spread perspective because at some point this lockdown will be uh, it will have to to be kind of relaxed, but I don't think it's an on-off switch. This is one where uh, people have to exercise discipline, which stays in place for, for a while uh, before, um, you know, sort of vaccination and all that stuff is, uh, is developed. I think that testing uh, methodology development is also important because uh, most countries are waiting for effective testing before they release the lockdown because that at least gives you a flavor as to who's infected and who's not, who should take extra precaution but I think a general discipline around this is always going to be good because these tests are not going to be 100% accurate at all times as far as I know. It's too early to say uh, that they're completely reliable. So they're better than nothing, but it's going to take a while for them to be established and credible. Um, I, I think from an economic perspective, which I understand that um, you know, in countries with smaller economies, it's difficult for the government to keep providing stimuluses, although they should to the degree that they can. Uh, but I think it's up to people. There's, there's an informal economy. Well, the informal economy means people go and buy things without, uh, you know, all the, all the uh, structure and so on that governments uh, have. But it also means that there's an informal connection. You know, people, uh, if you walk down the street and there's uh, people who buy things from every day, you know, make an effort and find out where they are and, you know, sort of organize. I think groups should organize a way in which, uh, in which food is delivered. 
uh, in some organized way to uh, all the places where these people live who depend and drive this informal economy. Uh, and I think uh, people in the region know where they are uh, in all kinds of different areas. Uh, but I think an organized effort there is important and whether the government uh, can help in organizing such efforts, use uh, you know, the uh, army or the police or whatever to kind of help uh, sort of use their structure to help do that delivery. People in groups and communities who do a variety of things all the way from religious organizations to, to whatever can, can also form their same groups and they have to follow. I mean, the only trouble of too many people doing this is that they need to follow a certain discipline around it too. So, you know, people band together and do this and then they forget the social distancing or they don't have the proper protective equipment and all of that, then you'll create a different problem. So, so some discipline around that needs to be imposed by the authorities. But outside of that, the more people under the, under the rules who can go out there and try to solve the problem, the better. Uh, this disease knows, knows, knows no boundaries. You know, it's rich people, poor people in big countries, small countries, everywhere. There's no boundaries. And I think uh, it's an opportunity for uh, people to help others uh, in every way that they can. Uh, in the ventilator example, um, in, in a matter of less than a month, uh, you know, we put organizations together to uh, build products, to source products, to develop products, uh, which if we did it properly with contracts and business agreements and joint ventures and all that would take two years. And yet we did it in three or four weeks. So crossing company boundaries, this crossing country boundaries to solve a problem that's effect, affecting all of us is something that we've shown that can be done. And I think if you take the informal economy in the same way, crossing societal boundaries, crossing you know, your boundaries of whose government and who's public and all, all that kind of stuff, to go help those people in some way and be creative about it, I think is a challenge that everyone should take on and, and go after. Um, just to uh, sort of expand on what you said, connecting to what you said about collaboration, improvising, uh, making adjustments. Uh, right. Asif Hawk from Bangladesh is asking, as the deadly virus continues to spread, we all uh, are going through a tough time. What would be your advice for the CEOs and startup founders to overcome this crisis? You know, a lot of young founders are watching this. What would be your advice for you know, young CEOs or experienced CEOs? Well, I, I think, uh... <laughs> You know, that, that is a tough problem. Uh, it depends on your exact status, but I can understand the, you know, companies which have um, liquidity issues uh, are obviously going to uh, struggle at this point. Uh, you know, uh, the, the best thing that, that, that companies like that can do is obviously conserve their cash and all that, be careful with that. Um, and, then, and then try to, um, I guess, help in a voluntary fashion in any way that you can to make this crisis come down as quickly as you can. Uh, get support from others, find partners who eventually might be able to, you might collaborate with, you, you know, some small companies may want to get bought out and so on, but who are the companies who eventually are their targets, approach them and see if they can get some temporary help loans and so on. Uh, because um, in the end, um, you know, there is enough money in the system somewhere uh, that, that spread in, <laughs> in some other way. And if you could uh, find a way of uh, getting access to that, not, but then be disciplined in your spend is the best that I can, I can say. So it depends on your current situation. If you've got liquidity, enough liquidity and all your uh, concern is, you know, my product is delayed or something. I mean, I would, in those situations, I'd try to help society in, in getting over this problem. And you've got enough liquidity, be, be disciplined, but you don't need to worry about it. If you don't have liquidity, in other words, you don't have money to pay your employees or pay yourself. That then you have to go, uh, you know, get that money from somewhere, and um, you know, try to get help from the government or from other private organizations mm -hmm. who are interested in what you have, and uh, try to get some help from them. So that, that's the way I'd look at it. You know, companies who have liquidity, even if it's limited, but at least liquidity that they don't have to worry about payroll day to day right now, and they should just help the overall effort. Uh, in, in, and forget about their own priorities, just work with others in a boundaryless fashion and try to solve this problem uh, and, um, and help. Uh, and the others, uh, you know, obviously need to be worried about their financials and they need to kind of make sure that they uh, um, kind of get that help from someone and figure out who those targets are, whether it's uh, 
the government or its uh, prospective uh, partners or whoever and kind of go from there. Yeah, so the summary of that is, you know, pay attention to your liquidity. And, yes. Uh, and, uh, and that drives and, the you know you manage yeah. that yeah and yeah. and then also don't just think about yourself think about society because if society is better off eventually companies will also do well i think that's the underlying yes. uh, message in this that uh, it, it's time for us to also engage in public service to think about others not just be self-centered yeah. yeah. just uh, you know look inwards towards the company um, yeah. connected to money uh, mohammad mashuk uh, h khan is asking do you anticipate uh, a significant influx of investment in the health sector? If so, how can Bangladesh take part in that uh, expanded value chain? In which part can we play a dominant role? Uh, I think, uh, look, um, there, there will be investment. There'll be some awareness around this. Um, I fear it'll be a fleeting awareness. Uh, mm. But uh, certainly uh, the need for, uh, you know, ventilators, that, that's why I said what I said before about the sense of urgency around uh, using this opportunity to create a, a, at least intensive care systems uh, and units and hospitals and so on that, that reach scale in, in, in places like, like Bangladesh um, is, is an important opportunity. So that will exist. I think... Uh, uh, you know, there may be some more interest in, in healthcare. I think the awareness has clearly gone up. Uh, as important as the amount of investment is how you invest it. Uh, and like I said, uh, you know, just making cheap products isn't really isn't going to solve problems. Uh, you've got to coordinate it with training, with infrastructure, with awareness. People sometimes don't know that there was a certain kind of disease. And so all of that has to be put together uh, to the degree that that... Uh, that thought process develops. Um, I'm hopeful, but you know, there's no guarantee because this is a crisis type of healthcare. There's also a chronic management in healthcare, which is in many ways a bigger, longer-term problem. When people develop heart disease and other things that that go on, those things actually cost the healthcare system over the long term a lot more money uh, because this temporary problem will pass, whether it's uh, you know three months or a year or whatever. It's going to pass. It's not going to be here forever. Uh, the chronic care problem is there forever until people's habits change, uh, the management changes, uh, treatments are created that, uh, that treat people, the right people at late stage better. So, you know, there may be investment, but I think a more thoughtful approach to healthcare, uh, if we can take this opportunity for people to think about that, I think that'll be helpful. It is, it is a longer term problem though. So, you know, it's mm. not like, I, I suddenly pile in money and I have a sophisticated healthcare system in one year. It doesn't happen that way. It's going to take some time, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. It means it needs some structure and thought process. And to the degree that this crisis has increased awareness, we should take advantage of this. But let's not confuse a short term crisis management effort with a longer term healthcare effort. Um, in terms of Bangladesh, um, um, I, I think the focus there really should be in the country itself. To, you know, there's enough problems and, and opportunities inside uh, Bangladesh where the health of people can be improved. And there's a lot of good work that goes on there. Um, you know, sort of societal uh, care and in many ways, uh, um, you, you, you know, some of the organizations have done an outstanding job of providing um, health care. And the, as far as I know, the mortality metrics and so on are, are, are respectful, uh, at least compared to other countries in South, South Asia. So those are all good. I, I, I think building that out, uh, creating some level of hospital infrastructure where when people's condition gets worse, they can go there. Uh, I think those things can be done, but I would do have an inward focus in Bangladesh and see how you, there's enough opportunity there. You don't need to export. There's no need for that. Uh, just uh, solve people's problems there. And that's the way I'd look at it. And and take advantage of the awareness in healthcare right now, but it isn't, the, it isn't making ventilators that will solve the healthcare problem. I mean, it's one aspect, but that yeah. isn't going to solve, uh, you know, overall mortality rates and so on. Thank you. Um, so to, just to summarize your uh, comments on the business opportunities yeah. for entrepreneurs yeah. in Bangladesh, uh, one is export is an option, but don't just limit to export. There is a big market yeah. inside the country. Focus on that. Ventilator is an opportunity. Um, 
But what I'm getting from you is inexpensive ventilators is uh, not viable at this stage or focusing on that, the, uh, the numbers will not work out or it's at this stage, no. the innovation isn't there. No, no, I, I do think through this open source uh, method, you, you, the expense is not going to be that high. The, the, the ventilators that, that's open source is for, for that level. All I'm saying is separate an acute care ventilator from a subacute ventilator and don't say that one can replace the other. Uh, and, and through innovation, you can't suddenly make somebody's home into an ICU. You can maybe prevent it and make those things good so people's condition doesn't escalate that much, but some people will escalate. You're not going to remove that problem. And, and I think inexpensive uh, acute ventilators, I think will happen, but um, you know, that, that's just one aspect of, uh, of overall healthcare. And I think that um, the sorts of things that we're doing where we've opened up the design, if other people do that and people can look at that and make their own version, I think that's all fine. Uh, but, but in things like this, uh, you also need volume to get the cost down. Uh, just having fewer parts, so you can get the volume to get the cost down. Uh, you know, factories and things do help. Um, so, you know, look at that problem on its own. But if you want to participate in healthcare, there's a lot more than ventilators that you can work on. Okay, thank you. Uh, a lot of people are excited in our audience to learn more about this, of course, because of your, you know, of your background. Okay. But I, I recognize that it's a South Asia Youth Resilience Summit. A lot of young people are also watching this. So I want yeah. to uh, shift our focus to young people. Uh, sure. Many young people, uh, you know, watching from home, they're in universities or just graduating. Their, you know, uh, hopes are shattered. For many of them, the dreams will have to be, you know, deferred for a year or two, maybe. Um, what's your uh, advice for young people staying at home, watching this, uh, in this time of uncertainty? How should they be thinking about the future? Sure. particularly in South Asia, where the number of jobs uh, don't match the number that come to the market every year? Well, listen, the first advice I'd give you is put things in perspective. If your education is delayed by the year, you can live with it. Uh, compare yourself to some poor family in, the, in this informal economy who lives in a crowded house with you know six people in one room where social distancing is a word, but how will they maintain it? where they can do their best with discipline and their jobs have gone away and their source of income has gone away. You know, compare yourself to people like that. And you know, yours is a temporary problem. It may not be nice, it may be frustrating, it may be all of that, but you know, you're still in a better shape than many others. So help the others, spend your time and help others in some organized way that you can and you will be better for it. You'll learn, you learn, uh, especially if you're young, you learn management, you learn how to, how to make, make things of value. Uh, and, uh, you know, money is made after value is created. And to learn how to create value at some point will be valuable to you, will be financially valuable to you. So take this on as an opportunity to help people who, have, uh, who are far more underprivileged than you are. And, uh, and uh, you know, if, if your studies and so on are postponed for a bit, you know, 20 years from now, whether you graduated in 2021 or 2022, you won't even remember. So, uh, you know, don't, don't put things in perspective. That, that's my best advice to you. Put things in perspective. Don't get depressed by stuff like that because there are a lot of people uh, who you have to help who are far worse and far more helpless than you are. And in many ways, use your time to be creative about how you can help that. That'll help the whole country that'll help uh, you know, sort of manage this problem better. And it'll teach you how to do things that eventually will become useful to you in whatever you do. How to manage people, how to create things of value are, are skills that can only help you over time. So use this opportunity to, to develop that, to work together, to form groups that know how to work together, to organize yourselves in a certain way. All of those things are skills. Learn how to develop them right now, and this time will not be wasted. Uh, you know, a degree is just a, a, a milestone. Uh, in, in life, uh, you know, a, a degree is, a, is an opportunity to do more things. It's not the end. Uh, and so uh, there are other ways in which you can learn as well. So use the time to learn and help others and you'll be better for it. And put things in perspective always. 
Thank you. Put things in perspective. I think that's a great uh, that's a great advice. Uh, just to let you know, Mr. Ishak, we have received uh, eight ninety plus comments and questions for you, and I'm only reading out just a few of them. Um, yeah. So, to dear audience, thank you for, uh, for for you know staying with us. I'm trying to sort of uh, uh, collate and uh, and consolidate in sections. But sure. uh, in terms of uh, uh, on the topic of uh, of young people. Uh, yeah. We have a question from uh, Hasibu Zaman from Malaysia. As a fresh oh. graduate during COVID-19, will it be challenging for us to get a job? Well, it, you know, it, it certainly will. Uh, mm -hmm. Most companies are halting recruitment. Mm -hmm. For research and development team, what are the skills a company like yours is looking for? Well, that depends on the specific uh, area. I mean, look, uh, there, there are uh, programs, engineering programs are ongoing. People are working from home. There's a lot of things uh, which you can do on computers, and 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 at least uh, in uh, in the countries that we're in, uh, there are uh, there are ways in which people can get to work under certain uh, rules. Uh, you know, you've got to get there safely, and then the number of people uh, in essential areas uh, can be present, and um, and so we're uh, formulating um, ways in which people can work. So. Um, you know, recruitment right now is, is obviously uh, difficult because, uh, you know, you need to go through interview processes, you need to go through a whole series of processes, which right now is difficult. So, you know, we, we cannot recruit right now, but, but that doesn't mean the need isn't there. And um, again, I, I would, uh, I think it's unlikely that you can actually, unless you, you're well in the process of getting the job, in which case, uh, you know, that may well happen. Um, I, I'd use this time to, um, to leverage whatever learning you have and see how you can contribute. Uh, and uh, if there isn't, if you're in an area that really isn't relevant for that kind of stuff, um, then um, then sort of educate yourself more, you know, understand, think about where you want to go. So use the time in a useful fashion. Um, you know, companies, um, even if liquidity and all that stuff is not an issue, which most many companies don't have that problem, just the process of recruitment is um, is just too difficult. So unless someone's got a very specific need for something right now, and, and you're one of those, in which case I think it'll go ahead. But if it's a general kind of uh, need for a fresh engineer in, in some project, uh, I mean, it'd be very difficult for companies to finish the recruitment process right now and just be realistic about that um, and kind of go from there. I don't know if I fully answered the question, but that, that's about the best I thing think I think you did. It's just uh, being realistic. Yeah and being open yeah. to it. Of course, you know, being realistic means that accepting the fact that getting a job may take longer than I expected. But how do I use this time productively uh, in this yes. time? You know, how can I yeah. sort of be productive, take an online course, yeah. volunteer in the community, make a difference in the life? Or, of or if you want, uh, you know, if you already have a, a company you wanna work for, you know, learn more about the company. If you have no people in that company, you know, volunteer, uh, you know, free work if, if you if you want to or learn more about it. And, you know, you may you may get a varied response, but uh, in some situations, uh, if you've interviewed with somebody or something already, you know, you might be able to use that connection to say that, look, uh, you know, I know this is not all settled, but, you know, we've got time in our hands and I'm at home. And um, is there something that I can help with or is there something that I can learn about? And you never know, uh, at least try things like that. Yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, it's 10.20. We have 10 minutes remaining. I, I want to spend yeah. a bit of time uh, learning a bit more about you uh, okay. and, and learning a bit more about the key decisions that differentiated you uh, from others. Um, and uh, I, I, I think I have a good uh, segue into that. Uh, Mehdi Zaman is asking, uh, Jack Welch mentioned you in his book, Straight from the Gut, yeah. regarding your yeah. contribution in developing yeah. ultrasound technology. Yeah. What did you do differently from others who failed in this aspect? Well, uh, you know, a lot of people succeeded. I'm not the only one who did ultrasound. There's a whole whole variety of things. People who succeeded uh, along with me in other companies, people who succeeded before me, people who succeeded after me. So, you know, just because I happen to uh, know Jack Welch and he kind of helped me a lot and he wrote about me doesn't make me the only person who's done this. So let's, let's keep that perspective in mind. Uh, I, I think uh, from my own personal experience, uh, I will say two things. Before I say what I did, I'll say what others did. And, you know, there are three or four people who made huge bets on me. 
uh, I was hired by a gentleman called uh, uh, Jim Pisa, who is actually here in California because that's where I took my first job. And I was a graduate student in England, just finishing my PhD. And I wanted to work in California because Silicon Valley was just coming up and I was really excited as an engineer to work there. And so I sent my resume out to people and said, look, I'm just finishing my PhD in this area, hire me. And you know, I had the uh, sort of confidence to do that, but that, that many people had that. But Jim Pisa saw my resume and said, I'm gonna hire this guy for whatever reason. He, had, he could have hired somebody. There's no shortage of PhDs in California. And yet he hired this guy who's, who was working in, in the field at, in ultrasound, which is what, the, uh, what that company was doing. But he hired me, he got my visa, he got me into the US, he gave me a job. And uh, if he hadn't made that bet on me, I mean, something else might have happened, but I, I'll never forget that. Uh, Jack Welch uh, bet on me. Uh, and the reason he bet on me is because in the years preceding to that, I had developed a relationship with customers, with physicians. And I built a collegial relationship with them, not a sales relationship with them. And in, in the field of medical technology, uh, engineers and physicians can work together to solve a problem. And it goes back to this common problem. And through that, you build a, a respectful relationship between colleagues and the sales and all that stuff can happen uh, because of that. But I'd built that relationship with a lot of customers. And when Jack was trying to build the uh, uh, ultrasound business in GE and failing repeatedly, he asked those customers, you know, I'm trying to do these systems and, and they don't work and you guys don't buy them. And the customer said, maybe you should have somebody who knows ultrasound to work in your, in your ultrasound division. And said, so, well, who can we hire? And those customers named me, and that's why they hired me. That's why Jack hired me. And then he taught me as a, by that time I was, you know, running engineering teams and so on, but in small companies. What GE then taught me is how to work in a big corporation and scale. And then, and, and, you know, I rose in GE and then the Medtronic board of directors bet on me as a CEO of Medtronic. Medtronic is a, I'd never had a CEO from outside of Minnesota forget about outside of the United States and someone with a funny name coming from God knows where, and they bet on me. Uh, they bet on me and, uh, and then again, they, they didn't have to. There were other people they could have bet on and they could have gone in their comfort zone, but they did. And so I really, I'm more gratified about what people have given me the opportunity. The only thing that I've done in this is when the hand was put out, I grabbed it. I didn't hesitate, I didn't worry about, you know, how much you're gonna pay me and all this. And I said, there's an opportunity, it sounds good. I'm gonna take it and there's a bit of risk in it, but I'm gonna take it because I'm confident that I can do that. So that's one that if someone puts your hand out, grab it, take the risk. Uh, you gotta know what you want, but be a little confident about it, but don't be shy. And don't Thank worry you. about, uh, you know, money and all that stuff. Worry about what value you're adding. Thank you. That's a great insight. Uh, Ahmed uh, Tawhid Rahman is asking, what aspect of your upbringing in Bangladesh prepared you to become successful in the global arena? So that's one question. And I want to sort of uh, add on my uh, last personal question to you. Uh, you. You spoke about people betting on you and taking opportunities. That's wonderful. But why did people consistently throughout your career bet on you? What did they see in you? And what can a 22-year-old uh, sitting somewhere in India, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, Nepal, anywhere in the region, learn from that? What can they do now so mm -hmm. that when people in mm -hmm. position of authority look at them, they also mm -hmm. bet on them? Mm -hmm. What works well, for you? You know, have, have um, uh, in, in my view, um, you know, if you're a technology person, learn that technology and use it. And, and make a connection, you know, try to figure out where value is created. You know, just, just um, and then I'm, you know, there's many other ways in which people do things. I'm just giving you my, my perspective and what, what I found has worked for me is that understand where value, and value is created means someone is willing to pay you some money to do which, whatever you've created because they think it's worth it. It's not kind of, you know, ripping them off and doing stuff like that. It's something that they really want. And, uh, and so figure out how you create value. Whatever work you're doing, how does it translate into something that someone else is gonna value? In healthcare, that's gonna be, how do you create something that in the end is gonna affect somebody's life in some way, or prevent a disease or cure a disease or whatever. 
in other areas, uh, it could be other things. Someone learns more or does something more easily or gets entertained more easily, but you're, you're creating a value of some sort. So have a connection between whatever you're interested in and value creation. So if you, if you do that, then you build that relationship of, uh, of doing things that eventually have get paid for, and that's how business works. And so understand the value creation component. Uh, the, the other thing that I'll tell you is that, uh, uh, especially the uh, people in the audience who are technologists and engineering students and people who've graduated from engineering, uh, my, my shout out to them is, uh, is uh, you know, engineering teaches you more than technology. It, it teaches you how to think in a structured way. It teaches you how to make assumptions. It teaches you how to create rules of thumb and make approximations quickly that are accurate based on, on, on sometimes little data. These are skills that you get taught in a technical uh, way in, in engineering. But these skills can be applied to business. This can be applied to your life. And if I have to say that the one thing that, um, again, I didn't plan it, it just happened that way, that I've, uh, I've benefited, benefited from is that I've never left that thinking. And, and at the same time, I've kept an interest in technology. So, uh, you know, see what, what qualities you have and, and, you know, don't think too hard about that, but, but do have some appreciation for how do you create value? How do you use what you know in an effective way? Because uh, those are my sort of uh, things that I learned, but other people learn other things and they've got other skill sets, but everyone has something. And try to organize your thinking around them. Uh, and then if someone gives an opportunity, grab it. So I, I think those are the things that I would, I would suggest. Thank you. That was very, uh, very useful. We have two minutes left. Okay. Um, if you want to uh, wrap up your uh, advice for young people, I know you gave already a lot of advice, mm -hmm. but if you were to highlight three leadership capabilities that you think that young people should cultivate in themselves, and there are many young people in South Asia who are watching this, uh, who aspire to be like you one day, a global executive mm -hmm. running a huge company. Mm -hmm. um, what advice, uh, uh, in very briefly, would you have for them? Well, you know, look, one thing, if you want to be a global executive, don't forget the importance of English. Uh, I'm just going to say that. I mean, uh, you know, this is not to deviate from your own cultural and then you know, should know Bengali, you should learn it and appreciate it. But, but let's not confuse that with the need for fluency in English, which is the global business language. I mean, that's just factual. And, and make sure you know that. And, and if you go to English medium schools and so on, you have an advantage, use it. Learn that, be comfortable with it, be as good and spoken and written English as anyone who's educated anywhere else in any other country. You just have to do that. That, that helps a lot. Uh, you know, understand it well, speak it well, um, you know, you don't have to have perfect accents, but make it understandable. And the grammar, uh, be correct about it. Learn how to write it. Uh, so, uh, you know, understanding how to communicate, it starts there. If you cannot communicate, it doesn't matter how good you are. No one will ever know. So you have to learn how to communicate. And, the, uh, and English really, in the end, is the language uh, that, that's global. So, so make sure, and in Bangladesh and in South Asia in general, uh, there is uh, lots of cap capacity for that. There's, there's infrastructure for that. Use it. If, you have the, if you're privileged enough to access that, use it and use it as an advantage. Uh, so that's one thing. Uh, the, the other thing is, uh, you know, uh, get different perspectives to the degree that you can learn. I mean, what has helped me is that uh, I, I have, uh, I can relate uh, to, um, to people in India, I can relate to people in Pakistan, I can relate to all kinds of other South Asian uh, countries, plus Egypt or China or wherever. Uh, and it's not because I'm cleverer than anybody else, it's just that when I go to these countries, I try to learn those cultures and, and appreciate that. And so that has given me a diversity of thought that has helped me build perspectives. And so learn diversity learn different perspectives, surround yourself with people as different as can be from you and you will learn from them. So those things, you know, absolutely learn the language because that's the language of communication, but, but get people around you who are different from you and don't pick a fight with them, learn from them. 
If you have a debate with somebody, learn from that debate. And the, maybe the final thing I'll say is that always have a view of people that their intention is good. Don't get insulted at the first thing. Don't feel that someone's out to get you, that you're being biased against and all that. Don't, don't, don't worry about that. You know, just assume that if someone's insulted you, it wasn't intentional. Start there. And most people, the vast, vast majority of people have good intentions. I assure you they do. And so use that. So start off with a good attitude that is constructive, that is forgiving. Start there. Learn the language of communication. Learn from others and other experiences. I think these are, these are three things that I'll put out there that uh, at least from my experience, um, and it's just happened organically in some way, but it's been very helpful to me. Thank you so much, Mr. Ishak. Very wonderful, uh, profound insights. We, we, we are really uh, uh, thankful to you for your comments. Uh, we are at the end of our uh, three-day summit. Uh, dear audience, thank you so much for uh, being with us. We received more than 1,200 comments and questions in this session. Thank you for your engagement. Uh, over the past three days, we hope you have enjoyed uh, our uh, three-day program. This is the first time we are doing this virtually. It's a changed world we're living in, but we tried to add some value uh, to young people in South Asia. I think it's a, it was a great opportunity for us to break barriers. Uh, previously, we did summits, physical summits, just in Bangladesh, but when this uh, lockdown happened, what we thought is why, why can we just not do a South Asian event and bring young people from our region together? In times of crisis, there is also opportunity for collaboration across boundaries. Uh, this is what uh, Mr. Ishak said to us. So we wanted to uh, create an, a platform for young people. We hope you found it useful. Um, and if I sort of summarize my key takeaway from this three-day event, uh, one is young people, you know, uh, let me start with what Mr. Ishraq uh, ended with, which is uh, in life, in any crisis, in any situation, there will be light, there will be darkness. Let us look at the light first and then look at the darkness when we are interacting with people. Let us give them the benefit of the doubt. Don't uh, judge their uh, intention in the first place. If we can look at the light and also connect with our own inner light, which I think in life is about not just thinking about ourselves, making a quick buck or advancing my own career, but also contributing to the lives of others, which is a theme that has been repeated uh, throughout this summit, that life becomes meaningful when you add value to the lives of others. And now is the time when young people in South Asia, in this moment of crisis, when the governments alone cannot solve this problem, cannot supply the, you know, the healthcare facilities, cannot supply the food for all who need it. We should not be asking, uh, where, what will the government do for me? But we should be asking, how, how can I uh, contribute to solving the problem? If I can help five people, if any young person who was with us for the last three days uh, gets motivated, inspired to make a phone call or help someone in, in this time of need, we will think that this summit was successful from our end. So young people, I encourage you uh, to think about others. And of course, our speakers have repeatedly also encouraged you not to worry too much about deferring your dreams. You know, this crisis will end, a better day will come. We may have to defer our dreams, but uh, let's use this time, you know, online education. There's so many opportunities in a productive way. We can also volunteer uh, in other organizations. It can be unpaid work, but let's stay productive. Let's stay busy. Let's try to make a difference. And the skills that we will learn will add value for our career in the long run. And Mr. Ishraq also, as he had so beautifully pointed out, that if you just focus on adding value uh, either to the organization or to society, you will get rewarded in the long run. So with that theme, I conclude uh, our 2020 summit. We hope to be back next year in 2021. And before I end, I would like to give uh, a vote of thanks to, to the organizers of this summit in a very short time, the VYC, the marketing communication team, all our you know, uh, team members, our campus ambassadors throughout Bangladesh and our volunteers, our students. Thank you so much for working with us. I would like to thank the Harvard South Asia Institute for being our academic partner and our outreach partners, Ashoka, the Asia Society, uh, the Global Shapers, Dhaka Hub, and Youth Opportunities and Youth Ki Awaz for working with us. Thank you, we are grateful for your support and uh, we wish you well. Please stay safe and stay healthy, and we look forward to seeing you next year. Thank you very much. Goodbye.